coaches, you know, I was talking to the players and we did our little meeting and um, I actually went to the toilet, sat down, they didn't have any doors on them and players were warming up with the balls and one came down and actually bounced up into my hands. So it did have some truth to it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no free kick. Folds at one half forward, pursued by Clayton, but he's got more speed than the Fitzroy player. A long shot at goal. Look at that one. The Bombers are coming back. Is well, 300 games, 16 seasons, two premierships. Uh, thanks for joining us, Gary Fold. No worries, Ron. Thank you. Keeping well? Uh, yeah, I've got a few little things happening behind the scenes, but uh, generally pretty good, yeah. Well, it's been incredibly nearly 30 years since you retired as a player. What, yeah. what sort of involvement have you had with footy since then? Uh, when I finished uh, Essendon, I went and coached up at uh, the Golden Valley. Yeah. I actually played for two years as captain coach of Marupna Football Club. Yeah, and then I coached uh, a year with the um, Bush Rangers, the Murray Bush yeah. Rangers, in their first year in uh, the TAC competition. Eventually got involved coaching in the amateurs and coached St Bernard's down here for about five years. Where you'd gone to school, hadn't you? Yes, yeah, yeah at uh, my old school, and then transferred to probably St Bernard's main enemy of uh, recent times in North Old Boys in, oh, okay. in Brunswick. And uh, I'm still there sort of helping out a little bit with, yeah. uh, with North, yeah. So you played at Essendon under four coaches, all very different in their own way. I, mm. I want you to sort of take us through them. But so you started as what, an 18 year old under Des Tuddenham. Mm. Now for younger people who might not be familiar with Tuddy, he was a pretty intimidating sort he of was. figure for a kid, I yes. bet. <laughs> Although we're good friends now, Des and myself, through the AFL Life members, yeah. him being president now. But back then he had a very big uh, reputation and uh, being tough and uh, training was you know, very, very hard. And uh, he was intimidating for a young guy. Pre-match, I'd learned to stand down the back of the group a bit because he, uh, he did get very physical, you know, with <laughs> the pre-match warm-up. In the pre-match, yeah. yeah and, okay. and like to, you know, Get in, get stuck into a few players, you know, at the front to um, show that physical side. And yeah. he was a, he was actually a great captain coach on the field. Uh, mm. I learned a lot from him, just the way he uh, approached his uh, his footy, and he meant a lot to the team on the field. You know, when he played, than when he didn't. So he was um, a great sort of inspiration for me. Yeah. The story that everyone recalls with Tuddy is the night he made the players mm. crawl around the ground mm. on their hands and knees. Have you, does yeah. that sort of stick in your mind? It does. Um, actually, it was a Sunday morning. Oh, uh, Sunday yeah. morning, right, yeah. And we'd been beaten badly by Carlton and uh, arrived for Sunday morning training, which wasn't too popular anyway. Yeah. And uh, and being a young player, I thought, I didn't really sort of question it too much. You know, yeah. Simon Madden and myself were both uh, in our first year. and But some of the older players, there's quite a few rumblings behind the scene. and. Players like Graham Jenkin, uh, you know, I think he took about 30 minutes to get round the one lap on his hands and knees, and and uh, Graham Moss, you know, great ruckman that the club had, and but um, yeah, we we just did it and thought, well, okay, it's a bit of punishment, but part of it, yeah. So, well, Tuddy departs at the end of that year, probably not coincidentally, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Bill Stephen takes over. So the yeah. first batch of baby bombers. Now that mm. was another interesting period. So you, I guess, I don't know, were you considered a baby bomber or the fact that you'd been there for a few years probably uh, meant you were one of the more senior players? Yeah, probably. I was still probably trying to really establish myself in the team up to about 76, 77. Mm. And so, but I, I wasn't really referred to in that, that group later on. So uh, probably just missed out on that tag. But um, yeah, Bill was great in the development of those Players like Merv Nagel and mm. you know Glenn Hawker, Van der Haar and everyone. So he played an integral part preparing the team for the 80s. So Barry Davis next, 78 to 80. Mm. Now, a lot of people feel that he was a bit stiff in a lot of ways. It, you know, he got Essendon pretty close. Well, he made finals in mm. 79, but he, uh, I remember in 1980, he said he'd resign if they didn't make finals, yes. and they didn't, so he resigned. Did you feel he was sort of ahead of his time as a coach? Uh, yes, I think he, he brought a lot more um, planning and reasoning into why we trained a certain way, yeah. uh, which was great, and probably needed another couple of years to see you know, how far he could take the team. Mm. It was unfortunate that when he finished and... Um, so why did he finish? Well, I don't know, back in those days, I think, um, you know, 
he was always a, um, a lecturer at college as well, you know, yeah. and he took that very seriously, his work. Yeah. So I think he may have weighed up, you know, the, the pros and cons of being a league coach. But uh, I've said to him since then, he would have been a great coach second time round if he had got another crack at it. Yeah. Maybe even, you know, at another club. But uh, he had a lot to offer, yeah. And then the big one, of course, Kevin Sheedy arrives. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone who played in that era talks about the profound impact mm. he had on the club immediately. How did you um, sense that impact? Well, I remember, the, I think it was the first meeting we had with him in the players' room back then in those days. And uh, I was pretty amazed at how much information he knew about the players. Mm. You know, he was going around the room and making comments about Van der Haar and... Watson and, and, and everyone there and and you know he, what he said about me sort of rung pretty true because I had a what did he say do you remember well he said because uh, I had a very uh, good year in 1979 yeah. and 1980 I for whatever reason just sort of tapered off a bit but yeah. he, I remember him making the remark that you know you've got to get back to the form you were last year and you yeah. did this and that and so he had done his research and uh, had a really good background of what the players had done where he thought they could go. Yeah. Having said you tape it off a bit, I mean, my memory of you as a player is your consistency. Now, you yeah. started on a wing, went to a half-back flank. You had occasional four A's forward. And yeah. I, I was going through the records and had this memory of, it seems incredible, now the day you kicked seven goals against Richmond. Yes. And they lost. We did. Oh, was it? Massive was a, game. It was, yeah. It was a big crowd. And, Round um, three, 1981, if people yeah. want to know. And of course, she's his old team, and yeah. he was very keen to, to win, of course. And I've been playing down the back line, but during that week at training, he came up to me on the Tuesday and said, uh, I'm going to play you at full forward. And I said, oh, OK, <laughs> on uh, Francis Burke. Yeah. Francis was coming towards the end of his career yeah. and uh, had been a magnificent player. But um, I thought, oh, OK, because I didn't mind occasionally going up there, you know, and... Uh, the good thing about it was that week at training, all I did really was goal kick, which is unheard of because she used to train, trains very hard. Yeah. And uh, so I probably had 200 shots per goal <laughs> during that week. And he said, look, you'll, you know, you should be too quick for him and whatever and this sort of thing. So, yeah, just went out there and it, it virtually panned out that way. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get in a few of the right spots or whatever. And... The unfortunate part was that we led and was chop and change all the last quarter. Remember Phil Carmen missed a shot yeah, in front. Yeah, and we ended up four or five points down at the end. Yeah. But, um, next week, I'm straight back to the halfback flank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Punched away by Nugent, down to Nagel, a hand pass out there wise, a chance now for Terry Danaher. He's got a clear go, but he decides to run back into trouble, boots it down there towards the full forward position. Yeah. Bowles, That's a great one. Great mark to Foles, and he'd only be about uh, 20 metres out from goal on a slight angle, and Foles on the target today with five goals up to this stage of the match. The shot is a good one, it's a goal, and the bombers... It was an incredible year, 81, because, so, you know, yeah. they lost, you lost five out of the first six, and yeah. I remember Sheeds was talking about making a comeback. He and, was, yeah. And then got on this incredible roll of, what was it, 16, 16 on the trot. In a row, yeah. And uh, the, the famous Neil Danaher game at Princess Park. Yeah, part of it, yeah. He does his knee mm. the next week, and then two weeks later, it's all over. You lose elimination yeah. final against Fitzroy. Yeah, we're very unlucky not to make the... Uh, top four, yeah. you know, uh, just missed out percentage, very, uh, very narrow margin. And uh, after winning 15 or whatever in a row, you know, you thought, well, we're a top four side, but mm. we, we couldn't get there. So the breakthrough comes in 83, you end up mm. getting smashed in the grand final, but it all, you know, I guess the culmination of the Baby Bombers really seven years down the track yes. is 84. Now that's something very close to the hearts of a lot of Essendon mm. supporters our, or our age, my yeah, age. Right, um, yeah. How fondly do you recall that game? Yeah, it was a, uh, well, it was an interesting game. In fact, that we um, were struggling for a part of it, you know, early on, of course, and uh, we really had to draw on some real uh, belief that we could uh, we could get there because Hawthorne had a pretty comfortable lead, as we know. Mm. But we felt that uh, I think if people remember the third quarter, we were starting to get on top. We were kicking quite a few points and. Uh, we felt that they may be you know, tiring and Sheeds reinforced that at three quarter time that uh, they, they, they had a quite a lot of older players and that you know they would they would stop even further if we kept 
the uh, the pressure on, and uh, we did. Well, one of the most memorable images, I think, is Terry Danaher with the balls, the siren goes. I think you were the first bloke he ran to, weren't you? Don't you two yeah. embrace each other? Yeah, and... he actually handballed to me, uh, and the siren went. Yeah. Terry himself, were, yeah. It was great to be because uh, we played a lot of footy together. Down there, but a mark for Danaher. Into this quarter by just on 35 minutes. There's the siren. Essendon winning their first flag since 1965, and the final scores. Essendon 14-21-105 to 12-9-81. In 85, uh, I mean, it just Essendon just got better and better. And 1985, it's mm. probably one of the strongest sides any club's ever yeah. fielded. What, what was it like playing in a side that you just knew was yeah. going to win every week? I think we really bounced off 84 and the um, confidence that, you know, and belief in ourselves. And yeah. We had a you know, great team, 85. We 84, we played as... As if we we needed to make up for '83 yeah. and see where it would take us. '85, we were sort of really confident uh, that we could um, do very well, and and even in games when we were behind, uh, we were still, you know, confident we could win the game. And I don't know how many we lost for that year, but it wasn't three. Like three games, and we went into the finals pretty confident, and um, yeah, panned out that way. A halfback flank these mm. days, I guess, is a really different position to how it was when you played. I mean, mm. it, basically, sides will play almost their best offensive players on a halfback flank and create that run. Mm. I'm not saying you didn't create plenty of run, but do you think that was the spot that sort of was perfect for your talents as a player? Uh, yeah, probably in the end, although I really did enjoy I had a couple of years on the wing. I liked uh, yeah. playing forward, defence and defence. Uh, but yeah, half back suited my play, I think with um, reading the play, uh, you know, I was uh, able to maybe work out where the ball might be going. Um, maybe a little before maybe even the, you know, the forward I was playing on or whatever. So I think it suited, suited that part of my game. And uh, although I did, being a very offensive player as a younger player, I sort of had knowledge about both, but yeah, the back line sort of, I think, suited my game and I liked to sort of, you know, run with the ball at times and try and get it to uh, a forward, yeah. I don't want you to blow your own trumpet, but you're a great reader of the play. I mean, you, you were, um, for that position, a prolific possession winner. In fact, I remember, I think when you played your 300th, I did a mm. piece on you in The Age and spoke to Sheeds and he, I think the quote was something like, Gary Foles could go to the toilet and find the ball. You know, like you yeah. never had any trouble getting the footy, did you? Yeah, yeah. That uh, quote's been mentioned a few times <laughs> over the years, and um, I tell a story of uh, a practice match we played at Warwick Nabeel, and uh, Shees, you know, was talking to the players, and we did our little meeting, and um, then we uh, had a time before we went out in the ground. They actually went to the toilet, and sat down. They didn't have any doors on them. And players were warming up with the balls, and one came down, actually bounced up into my hands. Um, so it did have some truth to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never so, heard. Yeah. That. So um, yeah, these things how funny how they work out. Yeah. Uh, that's a ripper. As we approach the 20-minute mark, a short pass, fouls. Down he goes. You'll get a free kick and a mark. This should put him in front by uh, 27 points if he's successful with this kick. There it is on its way. Now that's coming around nicely, it's a goal. Not a throw, says the umpire, play on. The Bombers do, Western, I think, or is it Foles? Has a shot at goal, bounces it through, and puts it through for another one. Last one, it's sort of hard to ask someone to uh, sum themselves up, but if, you know, people that are younger and sort of didn't see you play or whatever, how, how would you like to be remembered as an Essendon player? Uh, well, probably something you mentioned before, that it was consistent, probably, for the most part. Uh, hopefully didn't have too big a gap between my better games and my not so good games. Mm. Um, someone who tried to contribute or you know, always to the team and uh, uh, make some sort of impact towards uh, success for the team. And uh, yeah, just enjoyed my footy. Uh, grew up in Essendon as a local boy. Bit of a dream come true. Things sort of, for the most part, worked out as well as I could have expected. Yeah. Well, you're an indispensable part of uh, a fantastic and memorable era. Very fondly remembered, uh, Gary Foles. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ron. Good on you. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed that chat. Uh, if you want to hear a full version of the interview with Gary Foles, check out the podcast on the Essendon Football Club website. <laughs>